Psalm 118. <clears throat> and this is the last psalm that I'm going to be dealing with in the manner that we have been doing up to this point. Now we're going to be, we still got a month left actually. <laughs> And uh, I'm going to deal with psalms in a whole different light after this, <clears throat> which will be to deal with them in light of the history in the, the books of histories, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, and be comparing the psalms that match that history. And we'll talk about it from that viewpoint. This is the last one we'll be dealing with just strictly straight up as a psalm on its own. <clears throat> And um, we're in Psalm 118, and uh, I primarily want to look at verse 22. We were talking about titles, uh, and I was thinking something like, the stone which the, build the builders rejected. The stone which the builders rejected. <clears throat> However... The actual title will be The Stone Which the Builders Refuse. That's the one we're going with. <clears throat> All right. This uh, particular psalm is, uh, if it's not the most, it's one of the top two most quoted psalms in, in the New Testament and other places, actually. And it's going to be, since we're dealing with verse 22, we're going to be dealing with Jesus as the rock or as the stone. And... Um, we want to discover how the founding fathers, the early ones who were called out of Egypt, the builders, how they rejected or refused this stone or this rock. <clears throat> because... Uh, uh, well, let me just read a little bit here. The usage of Jesus as the rock is not just random, but it's based on the Lord's history with Israel as a rock. And this is important because a lot of times we just sort of think that, that uh, the New Testament is speaking metaphorically when it's speaking historically, it's speaking prophetically based on past things. So... Uh, the Lord speaks to them according to what they are familiar with and according to former relations he has had with them in the past. As time goes on, that reality is expanded, but it has its foundation upon things he previously showed his people. Now, isn't this true of you and me? That the Lord, when the Lord speaks to us, many times he speaks based on prior dealings that he's already done, and he builds on that. And that's an ongoing thing because the Lord's working in our lives. And so he's building on something. And a lot of times he's building on his past dealings with us. Well, that's what we're referring to in relationship to Israel and the rock. Um, the first and primary relationship that God ever had with Israel concerning a rock, the first and primary relationship that Israel that God had with Israel concerning a rock was in the wilderness just after leaving Egypt. Jesus represented the smitten rock. And if you remember, they came out of Egypt. It didn't take them very long in the wilderness. They began to complain. <clears throat> they needed what? They needed water. Okay. <clears throat> and so God told Moses, go stand on the rock, smite the rock. And Jesus is that smitten rock. And I'm just going to say it right up front. This is the stone. This is the rock that the builders rejected. And not just this one, but the one that followed them all the way through the wilderness that they didn't get. They couldn't get. They couldn't get it figured out. They, they didn't see it as that. So, um, so again, I'm going to have to stay true to reading if I'm going to finish this, this one here. The New Testament supports this view by telling us that Jesus was the rock in the wilderness. That's in 1 Corinthians 10, 4. And it says Jesus was that rock in the wilderness relating to where they got water. <clears throat> and so 
There's no argument anymore. This isn't a theory. This is the New Testament is confirming Jesus is the rock that was basically rejected. <clears throat> um, a rock is hard. It's strong. It's enduring. And in this case, it was full of water. And that's very significant because their confrontation with the rock or their uh, relating with the rock came on the basis of needing water, okay? So here we just described the strength of a rock, but Israel was weak and dry, and they were dying in the wilderness. Now, from that right there, you have to draw the contrast. God's talking. God is speaking. God is making a point. God is showing the strength of the rock compared to the weakness of Israel. Okay? Um, in the exodus from Egypt, they had experienced the smiting of the lamb at Passover. <clears throat> I'm going to be using the example of this smiting of the lamb and the smiting of the rock. They're two different things, and they represent two different things, and we'll get into that. But I want to I show you by their history and other psalms, uh, how they really missed the smiting of the lamb and the smiting of the rock and how big that plays in the fact that these people keep bringing this up over and over and over. <clears throat> um, the lamb was smitten. Uh, in the exodus from Egypt, they had experienced the smiting of the lamb at Passover. The lamb was smitten because of their sin, right? But the rock was smitten based on their need and their weakness. Remember, they were dry, they were dying, they were hurting. And, and the rock wasn't smitten to save them from Egypt or Pharaoh or the house of bondage, okay? Um, the result of the smitten rock was not the removal of sin or blood on the doorpost, but it was an outflow of what was in the rock to be in us, the people of God. That's why it was smitten. For what was in the rock to be in us. So it's about a flow to the weak. And the Bible, the Psalms, David's writings, Deuteronomy, uh, will confirm this over and over and over. And everywhere it brings up the rock, it's going to bring up that either the rock is your strength or that you're in weakness apart from the rock. Okay, That's the foundation right there to be able to understand this whole thing in relationship to the rock. <clears throat> By the lamb, they were saved from the house of bondage, but once saved, they were confronted with another need, a completely different need. Israel was not just thirsty, but they were dying of thirst. Therefore, it was life that they needed for the daily journey. It was life that they needed in relationship to the daily journey, not life from death in the sense of they were already dead or whatever. <clears throat> God's answer was not the smiting of the lamb that had already been done to bring them out, but the smiting of the rock. They needed life, so it was life that flowed to them. But what flowed out of the rock must also flow into them, or being smitten as a rock would fail its purpose. In other words, you don't just smite the rock for the general purpose of smiting the rock. The smiting of the rock is opening him up so that stuff can flow out of him. Amen? Except there's more to it. What flows out of him is meant to flow into them. Okay? Remember, the builders refused this. The founding people who came out. Um, <clears throat> so... The whole point directed toward God's people was that they become a partaker. Not just a believer, because to become a partaker, wouldn't it be more interesting if we, we, we worked that into the minds and hearts of Christians 
that you are to become a partaker, not just a believer in facts about things. For example, what is it? Peter says that we might be partakers of the divine nature. Well, that's his nature out of him outflow into us. <clears throat> All right, so the whole point directed was that they become a partaker. Jesus did not strengthen their strength or increase their love. He became life in them. So to drink, to drink of this rock means what? <clears throat> it means to take liquid on the inside and watch it refresh and strengthen renew and revive it means if you saw Israel in the wilderness and they were dying of thirst and they were shriveled up and they were weak and they couldn't go on and they <clears throat> it caused them to complain and everything else that when they simply drank and took the rocks inner resources into them they were refreshed they were strengthened. They were revived. <clears throat> so it, it could have done this by pouring water on them, right? You know, you could, right? You could pour water on someone and refresh them. This is what most church members want. They don't want to drink of the rock. They just want it poured on top of them. Oh, Lord, pour out your spirit. Oh, Lord, pour something on us. Am I right or not? I mean, think about the general view of how they want to get refreshed but it doesn't refresh your insides when your insides are refreshed your outsides will be refreshed you can refresh your outside and go back to being unrefreshed pretty quickly you know <clears throat> especially in the heat of the desert the dry places when you're in the dry places well for example you go to church and the lord moves in the service you can feel refreshed, but you can go home. By the time you get home, you can already be, you know, messed up again, back to your old ways. Yeah. Refreshed. Refreshed. <laughs> yeah. Refreshed. Very good. Very good. <clears throat> All right. So, so many Christians today want it poured on them, and they fail, uh, they fail to take it in to them. The rock was there to save their life by giving them of the interior of itself. Not just refreshing. Come on. I mean, you got to see this or you'll be one who misses the rock, who refuses the rock based on something else. you got to see that the goal is not just refreshment, but to get what's on the inside of him on, into the inside of you. That's the key. That's the whole point of, of what's being shared here. <clears throat> it is, it's hidden streams would become their living streams. You know, David said, all my streams are in me. All of them flow from you into me and in me, out of me. But what is there to know beyond partaking of the rock? Well, we may drink and be refreshed and thank God, but do we know that Jesus did not just give it, give us the refreshment? Do we know that? Do we understand not just the rock, but the smitten rock? Do we not understand? Do we just think in terms of miracles and blessings, or do we understand the source of all things, folks? Christ in him crucified is the source of all things. A lot of people don't like to hear that. They don't want it. They reject it. But it's still the truth and always will be. Nothing comes to us except it came through the cross and comes to us in resurrection. Um, so uh, as rock, he had to be smitten for it to come out to us. In other words, what was in him in terms of streams of life could not just come out to us. He had to be smitten. He couldn't just offer it like this. Here, take this. That's the way we pray. We have no understanding of the rock, therefore we refuse it. We reject it. And we pray in, in accord with a rejection of the rock as God prese presented it to Israel and to his people. <clears throat> um, 
what comes to us freely ended up costing him, it cost him even as a rock. Even, not just as a lamb, but even as a rock it cost him. He was broken for us. This smiting or death was not because of sin like the lamb. The lamb was smitten for sin, but the rock wasn't smitten because of sin, but to impart its very own springs as a life source to us. David said, well, here I'm quoting it. David said, all, all my springs are in thee. Isn't that just beautiful, though? I, mean, I just love that. You know, oh, that I could say that all the time under all circumstances, and that is my desire. But though Israel was blessed and, refl and refleshed, <laughs> and refreshed, they did not comprehend the rock in its true, get this, they did not comprehend the rock in its true relationship to us. They missed the relationship that God set up between Israel and the rock. And we miss it today. Okay? They did not see the rock as anything more than another of a long line of miracles <clears throat> from God with no particular emphasis on the means by which this is coming to us. It's easy to watch, you know, living is easy with eyes closed, misunderstanding all you see. I'm sorry, I'm quoting the Beatles there, but, that's, <clears throat> but that is an absolute fact. It, it's easy to just live with your eyes closed, not really seeing it, and, and not understanding these things. <clears throat> Their primary emphasis for how they would make the journey that God wanted was upon following Moses. And let me, I don't know that you have to keep your place here. So let's just go ahead and go to Romans 9. And I want to show you this. Romans 9. All right. We're going to see in a few minutes this scripture that talks about the rock that followed them. But their, their primary emphasis when they left Israel and, I mean, Egypt and they went through the wilderness, their primary emphasis for how they would make the journey that God wanted them to make was going to be based upon following Moses, following the law. And you do know Moses, many times, even when it's, it's talking about the law, it will say Moses instead of the law. That's not uncommon at all. All right, Romans uh, 9 and verse 31. But Israel, who followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. Now, is that a little amazing that they thought that the true plan was simply following Moses? And <laughs> anybody could fall for that, right? Moses was following the Lord. And God wanted them to follow the rock, meaning to learn when they first came out in this relationship with the rock. And we'll see this. This thing was developed all the way through. <clears throat> Let me not talk a whole lot. Uh, but their basis was upon following Moses and surviving by means of miracles. But the miracle that we're talking about didn't come by miracle. It came by smiting. The deliverance from Egypt didn't come by a miracle. It came by smiting a lamb. It came by death. Say, oh, God worked a miracle and brought us out. No, he didn't. God killed his own son. I mean, you know. So they followed the law in order to obtain righteousness, but stumbled at the stumbling stone. They missed the full importance of God's interjection of the rock into their lives. 
Because of this fact, this rock ended up having to follow them, and that's over in 1 Corinthians 10. You'll turn over there with me. 1 Corinthians 10, and for that matter, we can start at verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And I want you to notice all that all our fathers, that's every family in Israel, their fathers were there. Every family. These are the builders. These are the ones who are starting the structure. These are the ones who are laying the foundation. These are the ones who rejected the, the rock. All our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and the sea and did all eat the same spiritual food and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock, folks, was Christ. Now, you don't get any more plain than that, folks. The rock was Christ. Moses might have been of God, but the rock was God. The law never was meant to be the way, but they were following a man who was trying to follow God, who was performing miracles, but he wasn't performing miracles. The rock was, if you will, the rock was performing miracles. The lamb was performing miracles. The smitten one was performing the way. Notice I didn't say miracles this time. Because they were, again, not miracles. They were death to the one who gave of these very things. And... Make it absolutely clear, this rock was Christ. No, it didn't say it was like Christ or it represented Christ. It said the rock that this was, was Christ being smitten so that you could live and make the journey. <clears throat> All right, so, because of this fact, this rock ended up having to follow them. The rock which followed them. When they should have followed it. And then when I say, and I, in parentheses I wrote, follow in this manner of partaking of the streams of the rock in order to make the journey. That's what following the rock is. Do you need me to read it again? Follow in this manner of partaking of the streams of the rock in order to make the journey. Let's be honest, how many Christians even have a clue what we're talking about right now? You know, I mean, that was the shadow. This is the real. The, how many of us are making the journey right now? Well, several of us. <laughs> no, no, we're all making it. But, but the point is, God had a plan foreshadowed with Israel, foreshadowed with them, which now we are with the real plan. And the real plan is what? There's only one way we're going to make this journey. That same Jesus who died on the cross as lamb to save us from sin or get us out of Egypt or whatever, however you want to look at that, that not being the important thing as much as also became a rock that was smitten so that what was in him could bring us to the end of the journey would be the resources David said all my streams are in the David was in tune David was a man after God's heart David actually plugged in not to the story but he saw God in it where did he see God? In Moses? He saw God in the rock. He saw Christ. He saw, you know, I mean, he didn't even say he saw God. He saw Christ. How, you know, how would you see that? 
because Jesus is the one who came to die that we might have, that, that through his death all things would be attained, that through the death of the Lamb we would be free from sin and free from the house of bondage and free from all that, that through the death, as it were, of the rock being smitten, we might have enough that we didn't have in ourselves. And Now, let, now let's, let's cut the rock out of the picture now when they come out and they can't find any refreshment, they can't find anything to drink. How does the journey go? Yeah, and, and badly. Whatever bad attitudes rose right there before he smote the rock was just a, a preview of uglier days to come if what was in him didn't get in us. Oh, I'm, I'm telling you because I'm going to be reading some many scriptures that, that are written later on that just flat say it. Just flat say it. Yes. And it's also a death. Right, it is a death, exactly. That's yes. what I mean by that. And, and that, that there's somehow a transference at some point from the rock to a man, as in Joshua, when they were getting to leave. So something inanimate that follows them that they are not aware of to an actual man. You know what I mean? Right. Well, and, you know. There, and therefore, the rock of life, can we call it that? The, the life-giving rock, the rock of life became a stumbling stone. Became a stumbling stone. Because they didn't get it. I mean, that's as simple as I know how to say it. They didn't get it. And that's, that's easy enough to see from the scriptures. They got something from the rock... They looked at it as a miracle only and forgot about the rock and looked elsewhere, which was to Moses and the law, and rejected the life-giving method of this rock. All my streams are in you. They rejected that method, and they just started following Moses. And what I said is they only saw this as a miracle. It's just another of a long line of miracles God was doing. That's all they saw. They didn't see death. They didn't see life out of death. <clears throat> all right, so, um, but this rejected rock became the chief of the corner. And that's the scripture that we read at first, Psalm 118, verse 22. This rejected rock became the chief of a corner. And we'll see what that means to God later on. Therefore, the smitten rock has two meanings. The smiting of the rock on God's part was to impart his streams. In other words, on God's part, I'm allowing this smiting so that you can get fullness of life in you, which is the resource of the rock's life. Water from the rock. Life, the life-giving flow from the rock comes into us. That's God's reason for smiting. Um, but the smiting on the part of Israel represented a rejection. A refusal. The law actually condemned Jesus. All right. So they let Moses build a tabernacle. It's called the Tabernacle of Moses, right? Instead of being one with the rock, uh, which is the chief cornerstone of the temple, by partaking of its self-giving nature and become the habitation of God being joined and built together into that rock, the chief cornerstone, the rock, the chief cornerstone. Does that, does that even ring a bell to anyone? The chief cornerstone of the temple. But they rejected that rock in, its, in his chosen method of smiting the rock of the cross of death 
and from that death flowing life, his life into them, they said, well, we'll just be Israel. We'll just be the people of God, and this will be a miracle, and we'll live off of it momentarily instead of living by it. And then they let Moses build a tabernacle when they were supposed to be following the rock, which is being built together into a temple, a habitation of God, a permanent structure. They missed it. They, they totally missed it. Again, we'll get into scriptures that bear this out. That rock, in its self-giving way, was meant to be the foundation of what they were meant to become, a temple in the Lord. The stone which the builders rejected has become to those who embrace this smitten rock, this cross, not just that dies for sin. Everybody, every Christian embraces that smiting of the lamb. This isn't talking about the lamb. This is talking about the rock and rejecting the rock. Well, we got out of Egypt. Well, good. Israel got out of Egypt and didn't make it very far at all. I mean, not very far at all before they were... The rock was the issue now. So how, how far has most Christians got? You know, a mile, two? <laughs> you know, I've been a Christian for 50 years. Well, how far have you come? Well, at least three miles. You know? Yes? I mean, it's just the heart of God. It's hope and grace, and it's just such a yay and amen to his heart for, for this to happen. Okay, picture this. I don't, know, I don't know how to draw it or anything. We'll just put a rock here, and that rock is the chief cornerstone. And by the way, back then, you know, a lot of times the, they just fit rocks together and stuff like that. But he's the, he's, let's not call him the chief cornerstone yet. Let's call him the rock that Israel was meant to follow, that Israel was meant to get more out of it than a miracle. They were meant to see the, the way that this happened, that the rock was smitten and therefore they had, that life comes out of death, therefore there's a flow, that it's not just a miracle where God poured water from heaven and drowned them with the whole oh, sin from heaven, pour it out on us, but he poured it out into them and they missed it. They, to they totally missed it. But he is, he is um, the, the, the rock. And as such, everybody's going to join to that concept. Everybody that becomes one is going to join to that concept. And all other stones, all other living stones are going to be joined to that stone. And with it, become one with it. And he's going to be the chief cornerstone. Let's see if I even wrote that here. Uh, He's, he's going to be the chief cornerstone to which everyone else is joined. We see it. We get it. There was a smiting and there was a flow. And we believe in, in this method. We're one with you. We're built together into a temple that's founded on you and your way. Not just the death of the lamb now because this, this, isn't, this whole temple is relating to resurrection and this flow is relating to resurrection flow. Okay? So, but Israel missed this. And they did not follow the rock, but followed Moses and, and his way of bringing God's things about. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Lord, help me. I'm still lagging a little bit. Maybe I'll be all right. Deuteronomy. Chapter 8. Sadly, there's so much of all this that I'm not going to be able to read because there's just too much about it. But 
Deuteronomy 8 and verse uh, 15. Now listen carefully. Who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint. Did you, first of all, did you just get what it says? It's talking about being led through the wilderness. It's talking about being led on the journey, right? Okay, so maybe I didn't make that other part up. Then it's talking about all the things that it faced and a place where there was no water and therefore they were parched, they were dry, they couldn't make it, they were too weak, you know. Um, wherefore, God who brought thee forth water out of the rock. All right, so that's, that's a, an est establishing a certain fact. Now listen to, uh, let's start in verse 11. <clears throat> it's talking about bringing them into the land, but once you get into the land, beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his ordinances and his statutes which I command thee this day, lest when thou hast eaten and are full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein, and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold are multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God. Folks, not just forget the Lord thy God. Forget the Lord thy God who brought thee forth out of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led thee forth. It just described two aspects of the Lord thy God. Don't forget the smiting of the lamb, the Lord thy God who brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, smitten lamb, who led thee forth through this great and terrible wilderness where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock, the smiting of the rock. Two aspects don't, so listen, now listen. We just read this, and we'll read. We'll just be reading the Bible. We just read the Bible. We don't let. We don't sit at a desk and say, "Holy Spirit, teach me." While we read, we just. I'm doing my job. I'm just a wilderness wanderer reading the Bible. When it says, "Don't forget the Lord thy God," he's saying, "Don't forget the Lamb and don't forget the Rock." He says it right there. I mean, he he makes it clear. You and he'll get into this. And you forgot that. Let's read, uh, well, let me just read this. Hang on, I want to finish this, this class. Uh, in Deuteronomy 8, 11 through 14 is a warning that you become satisfied with the material blessings and miss the means and revelation of the source and manner through which he brings these things about. You miss the lamb and you miss the, the rock. In Deuteronomy 8, 14 through 15, they forget the Lord in his dealings by the rock and become self-sufficient. Don't forget the Lord who, as a lamb, brings you out. Not just God who brings you out, but forget the Lord who, as a lamb, brought you out. Verse 15, who led you through the wilderness wherein are fiery serpents, scorpions, drought, no water, and yet gave you water. How? Through the smiting of the rock, don't forget the rock, he's saying. He's saying, th this is the cornerstone. This is the chief cornerstone. That was a shadow. This is the real. Don't miss the chief cornerstone of this whole thing. Verse 16, who, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, and that he might test thee to do thee good at thy latter end. He allowed all this in order to humble you and to show you your need of him as lamb and rock and manna. He, he did all of this to show you your need of the smitten one. Verse 17, And thou say in thine heart, My power and the might of my hand hath gotten me this wealth. But don't say in your heart, My power and might got this. This means you forgot the lamb and the rock. 18, but thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he who giveth thee the power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore unto thy fathers as it is this day. Remember the Lord, why? For it is he who gave you power to get water from the rock 
released from your bondage, from the Lamb. He didn't just do this for us as a miracle, but as a Lamb and a Lamb method, as a rock and a rock method. What am I saying? The Lamb was smitten and then they came out. The rock was smitten and then they were strengthened to make the journey. The, it's not just the fact that it happened, it's the method that he's saying, don't forget this. And not only that, he says, look, I give, you, I give you power to get well through this and that, that he may establish his covenant. He's not just making everybody rich for the fun of it. I mean, consider this. Their sh shoes wore not out. The, they, they, uh, uh, they were, you know, God did all these miracles, but he says, I did it one reason, to bring you into my son, to bring you into the land. I wasn't just doing miracles for the fun of it. Well, you know, I won't kill you. Just, I ain't going to bring you into the land, but I'm just going to do miracles for you forever. No. No. And everybody that follows the Lord any length of time, if you've been with the Lord any length of time, there will come a day that the miracles will cease. That doesn't mean that God doesn't still do miracles. You won't see them from time to time. But he's not going to feed your flesh with that if you're not getting the rock method and the lamb method. Now, every real person that would be honest will say, you know, it's not like it used to be. They will. They will. There's not a person I know that can't, you know, you say, well, what about Kenneth Copa? Well, I don't know. But I know what this says. And I know that the miracles ceased when they entered the land. Because they weren't living off of them anymore. Okay. And then verse 19. And it shall be if thou do at all forget the Lord thy God and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them. I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish. And if you forget the Lord revealed in the Lamb and the rock method and walk after other. That's what he's saying. That's exactly what he's saying. He's not saying, if you forget the Lord, see, and this is what, this is, here's us. You know, I, I just stay as ignorant as I can, and I just, I'm, a, I'm just a Christian. I'm a wilderness wanderer. I read the scripture, and it says, don't forget the Lord. So I hadn't forgot Jesus. Jesus is still Jesus. I'm okay. He said, don't forget the Lord in this lamb and in this rock method and start walking by other means other than life out of death. You read it. I didn't make that up. It's all written right there. But the good news is there's more. There's more. Let's go to Deuteronomy 32. Oh, Lord, help me here. Because this one has got so much to it, and I just know I'm not going to be able to, to just read it all. <clears throat> okay, get ready. We're going to do the fast method of this. Deuteronomy 32. I want you to notice if you have a title in your Bible, what's the topic just before that says Deuteronomy 32? The Song of Moses. Okay, the Song of Moses. Now, there were other songs of Moses. Psalm 90, Exodus 15. Exodus 15 was the song he sang when they first came out of Egypt. They hadn't even met the rock. This one is at the end of his life, the last words that come out of his mouth to Israel, and they're all about the rock. You say, well, that's yet to be seen, Brother Randy. Verse 4, he is the rock. Okay, let's just move on here. Verse 15. But Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. Thou art become fat, thou art grown thick, thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God who made him and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. Okay, verse 18. Of the rock who begat thee, thou art unmindful and hast forgotten God who formed thee. Uh, verse uh, 30. How should one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight except their rock? had sold them, and the Lord had shut them up. Verse 31, For their rock is not our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. How about verse 37? And he shall say, Where are their gods, their rock in whom they trusted? Folks, this, this is the last words of Moses. 
He's not singing the happy redemption song of crossing the Red Sea. He's not talking about the God of salvation. That He talked about the rock of their salvation. That is not speaking of the Lamb. That is speaking of the rock that gets them through the wilderness. The Lamb gets them out of Egypt. And they cross the Red Sea, and the Lamb is their salvation here. But when you get in that wilderness, folks, it's the rock that keeps them going. They'd have died within the first week without the rock. <laughs> you know? All right, so let's see. Maybe I should just make sure here. This song of Moses deals with knowing God is their rock. The rest of the verses show how he was their sufficiency until verse 15. When it first starts, it's talking about he's their sufficiency, and then verse 15, we read verse 15. Let's, they provoked him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto demons, not to God, uh, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods. Anyway, it goes on then verse 18 about the rock, and it just keeps doing that. It'll talk about how they got off, and then he says, here's what you missed. I mean, they were not mindful. They missed. Um, they lightly esteemed the rock. Um, of the rock who begat them, they were unmindful. Well, what's so bad about that? I, haven't, I don't even know this stuff. I'm just unmindful of it. This is God's method. This is how you make the journey. This is Christ. It said in 1 Corinthians 10, 4, that rock was Christ. And to reject him is to reject the building that you're supposed to be part of, built into. That is a habitation of God through the Spirit. And they forgot the rock. All right. I don't... I don't know if I have time to turn there. I guess I'm doing okay here. Maybe we should. Let's go to Daniel chapter 2. Pardon? Okay. Daniel chapter 2. And I didn't have a t chance to look this up, so I hope I'm in the right place here. Chapter 2. Yeah, see, I didn't even have the right scripture, but I found it. Daniel chapter 2, verse 31. Thou, O king, saw us, and behold, a great image. This great image, or what's another word for image? Idol. And remember, it was talking about you've gone to other gods, but the other gods are not real gods, they're idols. The other gods are not actual gods. They haven't turned to gods. There are no other gods but the real God. It's an idol of what they say God is like. He's not like the rock. He's not like that. He's not like this smitten one. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great idol. This great idol whose brightness was excellent. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> stood before thee, and the form of it was terrible. This image head was of fine gold. My God, this is a good, it's better looking than a rock. Its breast and its arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of brass, its legs of iron, its feet of iron, and part of clay. Thou sawest until a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon its feet that were to, of iron and clay, and broke them to pieces. Then were the iron and the clay and the brass and the silver and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away. Well, it sounds like a great image to follow. It's an idol. And the rock is going to deal with it. Okay? That no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And... 
if you read the interpretation, because he's just telling what it is, let's see, he's talking about all kingdoms, brass, silver, gold, all kinds of government that are not governed by this rock will be smitten by this rock. And this rock will become not a big rock, but a kingdom. A kingdom. So whatever is built by man, this stone eventually smites it and destroys it. If we do not fall on the rock and become broken enough to let him be the strength, then we will build something that is not him, and this stone will eventually crush it to powder. We either smite the rock, agree with the cross in our need, or it will eventually smite us in our strength. Because the image was strong looking, and it was gold and silver and all this stuff, and the whole point of the rock, the whole point of the rock is we are weak. We can't make the journey. We need help. Smite the rock. What's in the rock comes out of him and into us. We are refreshed and we finish the journey. What's in the rock is in us, okay? That's, that's the thing. This, this idol, this huge, glorious, be- oh, who can... Who would deny that this is, I mean, and look at your puny rock. It's having to follow us around. It's like a a, a sick puppy. If we don't find our own weakness and then appeal to the rock, then that rock's going to smite us in in whatever strength that we have. And that's just, you know, Paul said it like this, when I am weak, then am I strong. For his strength, the rock, is made perfect in my weakness. Oh, no, we don't want to be weak. We want to be strong. We don't want to believe in life out of death. We want to, we want to ooh, soar around. And, you know, I mean, I've been told that over and over, and I don't see hardly anybody soaring. <laughs> you know, you don't understand what I'm saying. I mean, I'm not seeing a lot. Somebody needs to say that to me and then just soar and then, you know, filthy rich and God bless them and, you know, all you know, dripping with all this stuff, and then come back and tell me, but I don't see it happening with any of them. And you know what? I'm waiting. If it happens, I'll go, I'll, I'll at least go, well, hmm, I need to, I need to check back with the Lord. But they'll put down the rock, and they'll put down the lamb, and say it's not the way, but they're not showing me that the way that they have is it. Live gloriously then. But I'll depend on the rock. I'll admit my weakness. I'll admit frailty. I'll admit lack. I'll admit, I'll admit dryness. The whole point of the rock was we're dry. But we're, we're lifeless without him. You, you people are pitiful. Mallory Patrick, you're pitiful. You're pit- Mike Wallace, pitiful. My God. Look at you people. All you got's the rock. It's all you got. Is that your claim to fame? You're going to stand before God, connected to Him, and be <laughs> come and joined in oneness with Him, so that you filled with the life of the Lord and boasting on that. Yes, sure are. Can't let you talk. I got too much here to go. Um, so, if we do not fall, well, I said that, we either smite the rock or agree with the cross in our need, or it will eventually smite us in our strength. This crushing would not be necessary if we did not build wrong. The, the build, the, the rock, which the builders rejected, has become the corner of a whole new realm. <laughs> it's a whole new deal. Hallelujah. <clears throat> We would have started with the rock and not let law and man build something contrary. This rock, this one rock grows. Isn't that what it said right here? And the stone that, that smote the image became, it grew into this thing and it filled the whole earth. It grows. It does not stay as one rock, but grows into a whole kingdom of stones built together into a fortress and into a fortified kingdom. In other words... 
The glory of the Lord will be seen in his temple. But it's not now, because now is not the time. Now is the time to learn to depend and to abide in that rock and to join with that rock so that the, the kingdom can be built. Uh, this definition of the rock for strengthening the weak and becoming our way of life is proved by David's use of the rock throughout the Psalms. He saw that the rock was meant to be what we followed and not the law. And I, I'm just going to say that maybe, maybe, I, maybe I can get into a few examples here. <clears throat> let, me, let me do that. Um, let's, let's go back to the Psalms and let's go to Psalm 18. Psalm 18. He says, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. I will love you, O Lord, my strength. Folks, that's a connection into the rock. That's saying, I'm not it. I'm not strong. I'm not able. I love you, O Lord, my strength. Verse 2, or let's see, yeah, verse 2, the Lord is my rock. Hello? <laughs> you know, I'm trying to show that it's consistent from the first mention of the rock in Exodus 17 all the way through that it is consistently the same story. It's not tricky. It's not sneaking up on you. It says it, okay? I'll let you say, I don't know about that. Let's, let's, let me just look right here. I think uh, verse 46. Yeah, verse 46 in there. The Lord liveth and blessed be my rock. Let the God of my salvation be exalted. Again, and I want to make this clear, again, this rock of salvation or this rock that is the God of his salvation is not the one who brought him out of Egypt. The lamb that was smitten brought him out of Egypt. Moses did a miracle of flies, no deliverance. He did a miracle of, of locusts, no deliverance. He did a miracle of turning water to blood, no deliverance. He did nine miracles, and finally the only thing brought him out was smiting. They smote a weak little lamb. That's what brought him out. It wasn't a miracle. Nothing miraculous about it. Walked over and killed a lamb. <laughs> Put his blood on the doorpost. That brought him out. They might be going, oh, thank God for the miracles and all this kind of stuff. But there was no miracle that brought him out. It was a smiting. It was a death. Might be a miracle to you. It was a death to him. What if you were him? Wouldn't be no miracle. Be a death. But his death brought life to us. But this is saying. So I just want to make sure that you understand. That's the smiting of the lamb. But the God of the salvation of your life in the journey into what God has for you requires the rock, and it's a different kind of salvation altogether. What's the difference? The difference is what's in this rock has to be in you. All of his streams have to be in you. Or you're not going to make the journey. You might get, you know, you might get to the edge of the land, the promised land, and drop, but you're not going to make the journey. Okay, uh, Psalm 27. I am going to make this. How much time do I have left? Two minutes? Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Okay, Psalm 27. Um, so, well, we'll just do this quick then. Verse 5, For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. Listen carefully, folks. In the time of trouble he hides you in his pavilion. There is a secret of this whole thing. He sets you upon the rock. What is setting upon a rock? Well, we can say, well, it's this or that. What is biblical setting upon a rock? God told Moses, go get up on that rock. Anybody remember that? Get on the rock where everybody can see you and you're a good target. And smite the rock in front of everybody regardless of what they think or how good a target you are. And watch life flow to the people who were doubters. 
In the name of Jesus, folks. The Lord brought me into his secret. He set me upon a rock. That's exactly what he said. Brought me into this whole secret reality of the temple, and he's the chief cornerstone, and I'm, I agree with this, this cross, this smitten rock, and I smite it in the sense of in faith knowing what I'm doing. Okay. Uh, Psalm 28, verse 1. <laughs> that wasn't far. Unto thee will I cry, O Lord, my rock. See, we're crying to everything but the rock. We don't even know the rock. We're unmindful of the rock. Be not silent to me, lest thou be silent, I become like those who go down into the pit. Because in the wilderness, folks, they were starving. I mean, they were, they were dying of thirst. They were dying. And he said, don't be silent, O rock. Well, how's the rock speak? How you doing there? <laughs> no. <laughs> No, here's how it speaks. Gush, blah, 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 blah. That's how it speaks. Uh, Psalm 40. I can only go so far with this, so I'm sure that we're almost done. <laughs> psalm 40, verse, uh, we've been through this psalm. But re, uh, verse 2. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. There it is again. It's either testifying of our weakness and the rock is my strength and my salvation, or it's testifying of in the wilderness during this part of the journey when we're trying to get into the fullness of Christ, this rock establishes your goings. He builds you up. He fills you up. He fills you with his life. He fills you, he fills your mind beyond, he renew, you know, you know what the renewing of the mind is? It's filling your mind with his resources. Do you know that? And what a way to think. You know, you can think the way religion teaches you, or you can get filled by the rock, and you'll, you'll live, and you'll bring life to others, and refreshing, and time's up, and you've all shut all your machines down, and I'm ranting and raving for no reason. But I don't care. Cut them all off. My God, people! Jesus is what it's all about. And he, remember what he called him, the living God, my rock. Because here's where you're doing the living, this section here. This is where you've got to live. You've got to make it across this thing and enter into the fullness that in truth is yours. But if you haven't learned the rock method and the lamb method, by the time you get in the promised land, you're not even going to know how to function. It's another land. It's another language, if you will. It's another culture. All right. I did finish. I finished. I finished. I finished. All right. We're dismissed. <laughs>